It is still Tuesday, March 29th, sometime in the afternoon. And um, we are gonna run through the basics of pupil waiting and how it works with Brad James in preparation for a run through of S287 on Thursday. And so, um, Yes, yeah, sort of ask, you know, this is well tread ground, but as Janet said, maybe if we hear it 40 times on the 41st time, it will click for each of us. So um, thank you, Brad, for doing this with us. Really appreciate it. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. So well, hang on for a second. There we go. Yeah, so I can try to turn pages. So Brad James, Agency of Education, and good afternoon. Uh, um, so we're going to, as, as Representative Kornheiser said, we're going to cover some ground that we've already covered, but that's not a bad thing necessarily. And please feel free to interrupt anytime you want to and ask questions. I don't mind. And it's better to ask the questions as they come to your mind. So, so essentially what I have is, is really one handout at the moment. It's gonna kind of run through what student weights are for, which you've pretty much seen before, um, how the student weights, how it actually operates on a very simple example, which you've, again, you've seen before. Um, and then how we how the two, two or more weights can interact. We're gonna just use two for simplicity's sake. Um, and then I'll kind of just very quickly talk about what's happening in terms of tax rates and such with, with how that works out. And again, as I said, answer any questions along the way that you may have. Um, so I, I, get, I guess we'll start there. I, there's only the one handout. I don't know what it's called because I was not organized as usual to get see what Georgia called it. But if you all have it. It's it called the current out. model, strangely enough. That's what you named it. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> okay. We do. You should read. Oh, you have it. It's right in front of you. Oh, it's yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Everybody has it. Okay. Yes. Okay. It, it, it's yeah. it's there. Yes. Gotcha. Okay, it's it's again. It starts out with kind of just an overview of what the weights do, and and without going over well trod ground, I have six things listed. They're kind of in order what they're doing. The I think the key point is that that weight weights are used to reduce the cost of certain categories of students because certain categories of students are presumed to cost more. Um, and so, what the idea behind Act sixty is, and Act sixty eight, and all the subsequent additions to it afterwards was to equalize the cost of the student. And we do that by we do that by equalizing the students, which means we weight the students first for various cost factors. And again, under current law, we're waiting, we are deflating actually for pre-K and, and triple E kids. Um, we are inflating for secondary, we, we in, increase for kids in poverty counts, and we increase for EL, and that's it. Okay, that that that's what we do. So that's what we're going to just kind of talk about here in general for the for the moment. Um, those those are the weights that we've been using pretty much since I've been here. The numbers have changed slightly for secondary, but the other ones have stayed constant. And that was the, part of the impetus for for the uh, study that put on by the UVM group. But the, the I think I think the one I want to draw, draw I want to draw your attention to is number three, where it says that if a district has a high percentage of of a any, any category of kids is presumed to have more cost. We would expect that they're probably budgeting to that. They're, they're increasing their spending because they have higher spend, cost kids. And therefore their cost per pupil is high. As we all know, your tax rate, your homestead tax rate is directly proportional to your uh, per pupil. Um, so there's this really cool thing built into YouTube where if you're a person watching a lot of committee hearings, you can speed things up to double time in order to move <laughs> through the testimony faster, but you have sped yourself up to double time. Ah. And thank you. Can't slow you down with a button. You can slow yourself down a bit. I, 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 I do have a tendency to start going faster and faster. I, when, when I yes. taught, I used to tell my students, "Just tell me to slow down." And you guys do the same thing. So, and then Carol has a question before you call yourself just, back in. Also, if you could keep all your words as loud as every other word, well, that, so I, I lose that. Janet can control I, that one. Yeah, oh, so, okay. so I would say uh, uh, slower, and I'll try to do the louder over here, but I can't slow you down. <laughs> try. Okay. <laughs> I get it. I'll, we'll, we'll see how I do. Um, so. That was great. That was <laughs> four words, right? <laughs> 
so so what what I was what I was blasting right through was was if if a, if a school district has a high percentage of one of the categories of students that cost more money, we would assume that they are increasing their budget to account for the cost of those students. Okay, that, that's kind of a logical assumption. So what we do to offset that increased expenditure of theirs before it goes to their tax rate is we, we, we weight the pupils. Because remember, the tax rates themselves are depend the homestead tax rates are dependent on spending per pupil. So since we're trying to equalize things and make, make it everything fair, if you have a higher percentage of expensive students, then we're trying to increase your student count to bring that cost per pupil down and to keep the tax rate roughly in the same area where one would expect it to be. So that's, that's kind of the whole idea behind weighting of, of the pupils. Um, yeah, I don't need to say anything else about that, I don't think. So, so that's, that's a quick overview. So the second page is, again, called Student Waste, is how are equalized pupils calculated? And what I'm about to say not only holds for current law, but it also holds for S-287. With the, the specifics will change, but the general idea is the same. Okay, it, it, it's, it, you know, the, the, weight, the weights are weights. Um, there are different weighting factors. There are different weights themselves. But the concept itself doesn't change. So what we start out with when we're doing the weights is what's called the long-term ADM. And you heard this term before from me, and you heard it the other day from Julia Richter when you, when you were talking about the, the uh, not cost equity, but cost factor adjustment model. Because the long-term ADM is the, is the denominator in the cost factor adjustment model. But it's the base of what's starting out with the weighting for- so that, Yeah, I didn't totally keep. So the long-term ADM oh. is the numerator and the denominator is- It's the it, long-term ADM in the cost factor adjustment model that Julia Richter was talking about is the denominator. You're dividing your spending, your education spending by the long-term ADM, long-term average daily membership. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there, what is the distinction between long-term ADM and ADM? AD, ADM is a one-year uh, count of students, basically. And, and by count, it's a little more detailed than that, of course. It's, a, it, the, it, it's based on the student census period. It's a 20-day student census period. And basically, one ADM is is a full-time equivalent student that a school district pays for during that 20-day period. So if you have one student in there for that full 20 days, they are one ADM. If you have a student who is there for 15 of those days and moves and is not there for the last five days, then that student will count as 0 0.75 ADM. So you know, 15 divided by 20. So that's, that's what an ADM is. It's a single year. And it's based on where the students live and who's paying for them, which is the resident school district. The long-term ADM is a two-year average. So, so if I was doing equalized pupils for this coming school year, I would be using the ADM count from this year and last year, because those are the two that we have. And I would just average those by grade. And then on top of that, also added in is the state place student count from the prior year, so from last school year. So, oh, go ahead. Uh, so what I'm reading here has long-term ADM as the two-year ADM average, I, I understand that. And then B says the long-term ADM is the count the state has in a given year. Um, right. <laughs> so so, so that's, that's the number that we're starting out with when we're doing the equalized pupil calculation. Okay, so, so what, if, if you were to say in terms of free equalized pupils, where are we starting? then for the state, it's starting at the long-term ADM. So that's that two-year average eight plus the state play students. That's, that's just the base where the, st the state starts. And that's what the weights are applied to. That's what I mean by that, by 1B there. Okay. Carol, that help? Right. My, my question is, I need help understanding mm -hmm. something. And you, you talked about number three. And so I think what I heard was, 
The reason for the weights is because if you have a, a school district has a higher percentage of a certain kind of child, then the spending per pupil would be higher. And because homestead tax rates are dependent on spending per pupil, we have the weights to help. But the word that I'm hearing is spending. And it's really, it's, how would you express that same thing if you're saying needs? Because there could be still lots of needs that aren't being met because the spending is still not high enough. Because for example, the weights haven't been high enough for the kids in that school district over time. So isn't it about needs, not spending? Because if you frame it as about me, about spending, and then you pop into this new um, cost factor and it, you're, you're dividing the long-term ADM into spending because you're not into needs. You're just, the, the premise for the whole thing is spending. What if this premise for the whole thing were needs? What if the numerator were needs? I, I think I think that's a that's a that's a great question. Um, I what I was simply doing was was talking about current law, but you're right. I mean, the spending does not necessarily address the needs of the students, and part of that is because we leave spending decisions up to individual school districts. The state does not tell them what they need to spend. That is not how that is not how our our education finance system is set up. Um, so, so in, in that sense, what, we, what, we, what, what, we, what we're looking at is what districts choose to spend. You could have two districts side by side with identical student populations and one may spend more than the other because that's what the voters have chosen to do in the school board. That's just, it's just, it's just where we are. I, I agree with you. It does not necessarily address the needs question. So my follow-up to that is thinking very, very big picture. I think it's a big picture thing. It might not be big enough, but if you wanted the spending to be equated with the need, what if you mandated that the spending be according to the need? Because if the weight is the is the need, if it's an expression of need, what if there were a mandate? to use that extra tax capacity to do the spending on those particular students. So you would say, a high school student, you know, we do need to spend more on the high school student. They have extracurriculars and they have a football team and they have the things that elementary school kids don't have, or, for example. So, so when I say that, then I wonder, and this I've wondered for a long time, 20 something years, would there be a way <laughs> mathematically to track so that you could say, well, this is, the, this is the help we're getting from the state essentially. And now how do we show that we really are allocating that as a school board? We're really allocating that to the students who are weighted so that we then can, when we present a budget can say, this is the allocations for the weights. This is the required special ed spending. Now here's what we need to increase the budget in order to first do those basically mandates and then and then you know what do we need to come up with for that plus for any other programs that we want to do that year or for you know settlement contracts, whatever. So so do you have enough idea? I mean, Brad, if we mandated how people spend their money according to need, wouldn't that be a categorical aid program? It, it, it would be. And, and what I was going to say was just kind of leaning towards the, the I still want to say cost equity, so cost factor adjustment um, model that we were talking about, because what that is doing is that is saying that that um, based on the calculations that this is this is what you need for a poverty student to bring that student from from the standard student up to where they're supposed to be on um, on the tests because they're using they're using testing scores as, as their as their measure. Um, it, it, that, that, that's, that's what the cost equity, again, pardon me, cost factor adjustment model is, is essentially doing. It's not saying, and I, as far as I know anyway, um, it's not saying that you have to spend the money on this, fat, on this 
purpose though, which is a, which is a different thing entirely. Nor does the current S two eighty seven do that. What what you're suggesting representativity is fine, but it, it it would be a marked change, I think, in, in how we do things with the state saying you need to spend you know ten thousand dollars on a student from poverty. I don't I don't have a problem with that, but it's just it's just not how we're doing it currently. Yeah, I get that we're not, but I just asked big picture. And not just poverty, but high school, every single thing. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it could be done. It, it, it could be done because we could track it. We could ask we could ask the business managers and we could do it. But I don't think we'd want to do it real time, but we already basically do it to a large degree at the end of the school year when we, when we collect the annual statistic reports. And what those are commonly known as the stat book, what those are are, are actual expenditures and actual revenues over the course of the year for the school districts. Uh, so you can, you can break that out. It follows the chart of accounts and you can break that out and see stuff i'm i'm not that's not my world particularly um, i'm not i know it's there i know it vaguely of it but i could not give you details on, on what it's doing and how it's working but but the data are there thanks Ben. george we're jumping way ahead here that's trying to explain this is just calculating equalized not talking about spending so so it would be really nice from my point of view if we let brad go through and tell us the whole part of how we calculate the equalized people. Thank you, Torp. Fred, I think that was your cue. Okay. <laughs> so, so then, so, so here, so here we are now, we, we have the long-term ADM. Okay, again, to your average of ADM plus state place. And that's what the weights are applied to. Um, without going through each and every one of them, that's just, that's just what happens, that, that's the base. And so what we're doing is we're increasing that count over time. Each time you put on a new weight and multiply by that weighting factor, you're increasing the count of students in the state. That's what's happening. And again, as I said, this is exactly what would happen under the under 287, S287 versus current law. They're just more factors and different factors and different weights in, in S287 than in current law. When, when all is said and done, when all the weights are applied and you add up all those weights at, with the long-term ADM, you have what's, again, current law statute, what's called the long-term weighted ADM. So it's basically, it's the weighted count of students is, what, is really what it boils down to. And that number is higher than, than what the state started out with. Remember the state started out with the long-term ADM, we now have added weights to it. So the number is higher. So what the law says to do is to bring the count in the state back down to where, quote unquote, where it should be to the long-term ADM. And that's done by taking what's called the equalization ratio. And it's, I say simply, it's just the long-term ADM divided by the weighted long-term ADM. So you start out with, you know, roughly 85,000 kids and you're dividing by maybe, I don't know, making up a number here, maybe 94,000 weighted kids at this point, some, something like that. I mean, it's probably not quite that high. But that's, but when you do that division, you come out with currently a number somewhere on the order of 93, 94%. I don't remember exactly what it is this year. But you come out with that equalization ratio. And that ratio, I'm just going to call it 93%. That ratio of 93% is then multiplied by every school district's weighted count. So we're reducing them all by the same proportion. That's what's happening. When you add it up, you then have the right number of students in the state. The equalized pupil count, because that's what you have when you take the equalization ratio times the long-term ADM gives you equalized pupils. When you do that for all the districts and add up the equalized pupils, it's just about equal to the long-term ADM. What's happened though within is that a given school district's count of equalized pupils is going to probably differ from its long-term ADM because it doesn't have the exact same ratios of secondary students as the state as a whole, or of triple E pre-K students as the state as a whole, or poverty. That's what's happening. That's, that's, why, you, that's why the long-term ADM to equalize pupils aren't exactly the same. We all good? Seems that way. Okay. So if we, if we go to slide three, and again, you've, you've pretty much seen this one. I did add one line down at the bottom in yellow. Um, this, is, this is basically how, how the weights work. And I'm doing a very simple example 
We're talking about three three school districts in this in a very small state, even smaller than Vermont. Um, we're talking about three school districts, and we are talking about just one weighting factor. We're talking about secondary weighting factor. So my my three districts are districts one, two, and three. They each have a total of twenty ADM, but they're they're breakout is different between K6 and 712. Again, I've simplified this. So District 1 has five elementary kids, K6, and 15 712 secondary students. District 2 is, has 10 of each, and District 3 is the opposite of 1. They have 15 elementary and five secondary students, but they all have 20 kids is, is really what it boils down to. The line that I added down at the bottom is the yellow one. It says state average. Um, and the average for the K-6, when you take those three districts, is 10. The average for the secondary is also 10. And, and the average for the state as a whole is 20 per on the average. Okay, So that's, that's where we're starting from. So the long-term ADM in this case, again, very simplified, is 20 for each of them. But their kids are in different places in terms of the weights. So the second column says K-6. There's no weight because that's kind of the base. But for grades 7, 12, secondary, there's a weight of 0 0.2. That's not the real weight. It's not the real weight currently. It's not the real weight in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the proposal from S287. It's just for simple math. So when you multiply that 0 0.2 weight times the secondary count, in District 1, you get an additional 3, because 0 0.2 times 15 is 3. In District 2, you get an additional two students, or weights, whatever, however you want to term it. And in District 3, you get an additional um, one, because 0.2 times 5 is 1, OK? Again, if you look at the state, the average is 2. And I'm talking about the average because that's because I mentioned that before. That's where the equalized pupil, why the equalized pupil counts change from the long-term ADM. When you add the weights to the weighted to the um, ADM, you end up in that column that, believe it or not, that's, that says weighted ADM. I just lost the vowels. Um, district 1 has 23 students, weighted students. District 2 has 22. And District 1 has 21. Again, the average for the state is 22. The equalization ratio which we talked about, because now, now we have more students in the state. We started out with 60. I should have said that. We did. I didn't. We started out with 60 in the state. We now have 66 because of the weight. So there are too many students. So we now do the equalization ratio. You take, in this case, the, the, the long-term ADM is 60, divide by the weighted ADM, which is 66, and you get an equalization ratio of 0 0.909. So when so, so I'm... My apologies for this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How many people in the state understand this? No, I don't know. Um, <laughs> how many? How many understand? I, I, it, I, I'd say I'd say maybe two handfuls really understand it. Yeah, and and in terms of people who are doing state but school budgets and so on, and the reason I ask it is that I think I understand. The, our ed finance system reasonably well, but it wasn't until last year that I knew that once you once you created all those kids with the weights, then you shrunk them back down. I, I didn't know that. Um, I know it now. I don't think I could explain to somebody how, or I think I understand a little bit of why, but I'm not that I could explain it. And I'm just, it, it's really, I think it's a serious question because it it helps us decide sort of what path we want to take here. But um, I this must just seem like an incredible black box to people who are trying to figure out um, how it works. I, I would agree with you. It is because I, it, it's as I was talking to somebody else earlier today. I, I used to go out to town meetings and, and school board meetings, such, and, and people would ask me questions, and I'd answer the questions. Somebody would invariably ask, "How are equalized pupils calculated?" And I, I would shrug, sigh, breathe out, and say, hey, "Sit down, <laughs> and hold on," um, because because it, it does get confusing. Um, you can, but but. Representative Beck asked this question, I think, last time, maybe last two, one of the last two times I was in, 
I think, um, about why do we use the equalization ratio? It's the exact same question you just asked. And we don't need to is the answer. It's, it's just, it's in statute. I don't know why it was put there initially when Act 60 was written, but it, but it was in there. And, and we've followed ever since. But you, 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 could, you don't need to do that step. You could actually stop at that step that says weighted ADM and use those counts because proportionally they're the same. You know, they're, would, they're, it, would it be different? I mean, I, would the result be different? It would seem that it would, but. Well, like it, 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 it would in that your spending per pupil would decrease, but it would decrease if assuming education spending was the same for everybody and didn't change. It would decrease proportionally for everybody, the exact same amount. And, and so that what that would do is your, your spending per pupil would decrease, but that means your tax rate would decrease. So the yield would have to change to bring in enough money. So you, you, could, you could easily do that. You could easily get rid of the equalization ratio without any problem and just, just, just adjust the yield by a little bit, you know, whichever way it needs to go in order to bring in the right amount of money. Because that's what you're doing with the yield anyway. You're just using a different pupil count instead of what we have now. But again, proportionally, they're all the same. So my um, district business manager, and please forgive me if he's watching, uh, <laughs> did his graduate dissertation on this, on people weights. And I have heard him say, and I've, he's been in the field for a very long time, but I heard him say more than once at town meeting, it's too complicated to explain. Um, yeah. Which the sort of, you know, the disconnect between no, like understanding this really that well and, you know, being able to explain it to other people is also sort of an interesting part of that question. Scott had a... Yeah, I just, um, using the existing, what Brad's going through, it's really worth pointing out that probably about half the districts in the end receive uh, fewer weighted pupils than they actually have ADM after you apply the equalization ratio. Yeah, once you've shrunk them back down. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's, all, that's all I can understand is that you yeah. expand them and then you shrink them. And it does seem to me that, that there's an impact. You're telling me there isn't any impact at the, in the end if we didn't shrink them. It, 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 I mean, it, it is counterintuitive to, to most people, including you. Um, it, I mean, it, it, it really is because as you say we're expanding them, we're shrinking. We don't need to do that. We could, we could cut that step out and it would just change the yield is, is really what would happen. The yield would go down yeah. to generate those dollars. Carol and then George. So if we stick with the current funding formula, we could just take this out. Yes. And then people would be clear. No, that wouldn't be clear. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I don't, I have knocked on doors before in trying to pass tax increases. And even when people are getting um, money and they're not actually paying property taxes, they're paying based on their income. And they still, there, there could still be the impression that, that they're, that they're concerned about property taxes, but they're, they don't, they may not understand that they are paying based on their income, not on their property. So, you know, there's a lot in the formula that's, um, that's complicated, but as far as I understand it, to make it more fair, it can look more complicated to get to the fairness for people. George? Yeah, and Brad, um, you kind of really just um, said, you know, you apply the weights to the long-term ADM. But um, there's complications in that piece of it, too. That some of our weights are multiplicative and some are additive um, in the current system. And I, you know, I, I don't know that we need to necessarily get into that, but it's not right now as simple as you apply the weights. No, that, that that that's that's correct. Um, the the and and S two eighty seven does address that and and makes it all additive. What the the part that is multiplicative is when you are taking the poverty count, the poverty ratio, I should say. Which again, we're jumping into my weeds now. You take the poverty ratio and you're multiplying it by the long term grade weighted ADM. So what you thought you've done before you add the poverty weight. 
you are calculating the poverty weight not on the long-term ADM, but on the grade weighted ADM. So you've already increased the count of secondary students. So a student whose poverty in secondary is quote unquote more valuable in terms of weighting and equalized pupils. That all hopefully goes away that's with multiplicative. whatever we do this week. Right, that, that, that's the multiplicative part and, and, the, and the Senate bill does address that and takes that out. They, they remove that and they make it just straight weight. So, so grade weight is grade weight, poverty is poverty, sparsity is sparsity. There, there's no inter, interconnection other than that in terms of multiplying on top of another one. But that's a good point. Okay. Yes. Back to you. Okay, so, so we now have the equalization ratio. That's that 0 0.909 number. It gets multiplied by the weighted ADMs. Um, you can skip that column, the district ratio. I should have taken that out and didn't. Um, and when you do the multiplication, the equalized pupil count for district one is 20.9. So they're up a little bit. The equalized pupil count for district two is 20. They're right where they started. And the, the count for district three is 19.1, they're down. Why did, the, why, did two, why did district one go up and district three go down? Because of where their kids are located in terms of, in, in contrast to the state average. If you jump back and look, you see that district one has 15 secondary students, whereas the state has 10. So, so district one has more secondary students, so therefore they get a bump in their weight, it goes up. Okay, and that's that's why they get an increase because they're because we're presuming that they're spending more for those 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 additional kids that the other districts don't have. By the same token, or opposite to the same token, however you want to look at it, District Three has fewer uh, secondary students than the state does. It has five versus the state average of ten, and their equalized pupil count has gone down because they're because they don't have the weights. They're, they're, and therefore, because their cost shouldn't be as high, they they everything should work out roughly the same. So theoretically, if everybody was spending on a per pupil basis, the same throughout the throughout these three districts, you would come up with the same spending per pupil at the end when you do these weights. We know that theoretically they're not spending the same per grade, per, per secondary or any of the other weights, but if, if they were, this is what would happen. What happens when we add another weight? That's the exciting part. So, so now we're going to page to, to slide four. And I'm not sure I, I had inadvertently made a mistake. Well, I always make mistakes. Um, and the first one that I sent to Sorsha, I did not show what the second, what the sparsity weight was. And that's our second weight here. So if in that second column where it says sparsity weight, it says it says 0, 0.0, it should say 0 0.1. I'm not sure what if, if Sorsha had time to correct that or not. Or get the Sorsha number. always has time to correct everything. She's pretty good. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Sorsha. So, so now, now as Representative Kornheiser asked, now we're now we're going on to a second weight. Okay. And, and what I want you to see here is how the weights interact with each other. Okay, because, because right now in current law, we're really talking about just a few weights. In, in, in the, the uh, new S-287, we're talking about a multitude, multitude of weights, and they tend to interact with each other. And so, they, so if one goes up and one goes down, you can actually kind of cancel things out a little bit. And that's what I'm going to show you here. So here we're, we've got the same initial information that we started out with, same three districts, same population, same, same grade ranges. And then I threw in sparsity as, as, the, as a second weight. And that's that second column. And I said that district one does not meet whatever, whatever the, who cares what it is, but whatever the sparsity criteria is, district one does not meet it. So that's what the no means. District two and three do meet the sparsity criteria. And in this case, my sparsity weight is 0 0.1. It gets multiplied by the, the total um, long-term ADM count of the school district. So district one gets nothing. District two get and, and three, they both have 20. So they each get multiplied by 0.1. They each get an additional two. Secondary is the same as what you saw before. Nothing's changed there. So now when you go to the weighted ADM, the weighted ADM for district one is still 23. It doesn't change because they got nothing for sparsity. However, district two has, has increased. Um, for some reason, no, it didn't. I didn't write that in. I apologize. 
this line, line district two should say 24. It says 22 because I didn't change that. And district three should say 23 instead of 21. I apologize. I did something wrong. I got part of it right on that one where I sent a distortion. So my apologies for that. Um, oh, so Brad, yes. the weighted ADM column should be the sum of the ADM total plus the grade total plus the sparsity weight total. That, that's so correct. District three should be 20 plus one plus two for 23. Correct. Okay. Just district two should be 20 plus two plus two for 24. And district one is the same at 20 plus three plus zero at 23. Again, the rest of the numbers are okay. I just forgot to update those two. It's very clever of me. Okay. So once, once again, what we've seen is, you know, we, we now have more students than we thought back to the equalization ratio because that's what current law says. So in this case, the equalization ratio is different because we now have not only secondary weight, but we also have a, a sparsity weight. So we now have a higher count of weighted pupils. So the, the denominator has changed. The numerator is the same, but the denominator has changed. So the ratio, the equalization ratio drops it, and it drops to 0 0.857. Okay, that's 60 divided by 70. When you do the multiplication, of the weighted ADMs, you hit get 19.7 for district one. So they've actually dropped. Remember they were at 20.9, I think. I don't have it in front of me. 20, 20, yeah, they were, they were at 20.9. They've now decreased, even though they have more secondary kids than, than, than the state as a whole or on average. District two has gone up from 20 to 20.6 and that's because of the sparsity weight. And District 3 has gone up from 19.1 to 19.7. So it's coming back up. It's still not, it's still not quite at the long-term ADM, but it's coming up. So the important thing to see is what, what happened to District 1. They did not get that weight because they're not a sparse district. And therefore, the weights shift between the districts. So the equalized, so the equalized pupils get shifted towards where those weights are. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing that the weights do interact with each other when you come down to the, to the end result. Is that, is that kind of making sense to folks? So this totally blows my mind. And even though you've so, like, I've seen it a bunch of times from you, Brad, so thanks for doing it again. The idea that we've sort of said that it costs more to educate secondary students for District 1 and District 1 says, yes, it costs more to educate all these secondary students we have. But then in the end, they wind up with less equalized pupils than pupils or than ADM. Mm -hmm. um, and so wind up with sort of less resources than state average. And that's just like, that just continues to blow my mind. I just think it's an amazing piece of the interactive stuff. It's, it's, it's not that they're ending up with less resources because they're still spending the same amount, we're presuming. Yep, that but their tax rate is going up. Yes, because their count has gone down. However, e e even if we if we if we track back the conversation a little bit to to ignoring the equalization ratio, okay. So we're we're backing up that step and getting rid of the equalization ratio. Just now talking in terms of the long term weighted ADM. There's their 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 weight has not their weight their weighted ADM has not increased. So. Their, their spending per pupil then is not going to change. Again, we're conceptually out here a few steps now. And so when the yield goes down, because as, as Representative Beck said, it would go down if we got rid of the equalization ratio to all else being equal, then as, as, as the yield goes down, their tax rate would go up. So the same, the same effect happens. That's, that's what I just wanted you guys to see, is that the same effect is happening whether you use the equalization ratio or not. You, you end up at the same place. It's, it's, it's going to just going to, the rate is still going to go up. We good with that? We're going to cost factor adjustments. I, I only caught part of that. It's I said it's a good, argument for going to cost factor adjustments, which is- They, they both have their pros and cons. I, I, yes. So you are gonna take us through weights and weighting factors. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other questions about the interactive effects? Okay. And what I, the, sort of the other 
thing that blows my mind about this is I could, for the two, we can sort of see it and get our heads around it. When you add in five different factors, you can't predict how they'll interact with each other inside your own brain. Only the internet, like only a spreadsheet is capable of doing that part of the math. That, that's true. And that, that was part of the discussions I recall Representative Kornheiser and back in, in the task force is that, that the results were not what people were expecting necessarily. And that had to do with the interactions of the weights, you know, where, where some people would go up in one area, but down in another area or stay flat. And so there, it, it just changes at the end. Uh, so um, before you go on to the, the weight, weighting factors, um, is 287, the bill coming over from the Senate, does, does that include the um, equalization ratio? Do they still keep that in? Yes, that, that, that is still in there. They, they did not take that out. And we're going to have a pretty comprehensive walkthrough yeah. with JFL and Brad there, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just very quickly continuing, the, ne the next slide is just showing you what the weights are that, that are recommended in 287 that are, that are used in the modeling that you'll be hearing about. And then the, the, last, the last couple of slides are just a quick walkthrough of going from a school budget to with offsetting revenues to education spending, because that's the number we care about when we're talking about tax rates is education spending and for the education fund to a large degree. Um, and then what happens is you change, as you change the equalization, uh, not the equalization, pardon me, the equalized pupil count. If it goes, if the equalized pupil count goes down, then your tax rate goes up if you're spending for pupil, if your spending stays, education spending stays the same. Can you take us through that? Sure, I'll be happy to, I don't know if you want to. Yes, okay, so we're, going, we're on slide six then. You're not gonna talk about the waiting factors? To be oh, I, I can, we can go back to slide five, that is perfectly fine. Well, I, I, I'm, if it's okay, I still have trouble visualizing. Um, the, I know about grade range. I know about, I know about poverty. I, I can understand small schools. It's the sparsity, population density one that I really struggle with. And the question I keep trying to ask, but I don't know who to ask, is what Tell me a district that has under 36 population per square mile, just because I want to visualize it. I want to know where it is. And, um, and I, I, will, I will open that file because I off the top of my head, I can't remember who it is. Um, are there lots of them or is there just one there, or two? I, sort of, and, and can I ask another question? Um, are we wed to those three break point, those three brackets? Is there a, a uh, sort of database reason why we're using those three with the, why we're using three and why we're using those three? Just, the, the answer the answer is yes. Um, again, I did not do the model, and according to Professor Professor Colby and and um, you know Bruce Baker and, and the other folks, when they were looking at sparsity and cost, what what they found were their inflection points where the, where the, where the slope changed dramatically. You in this case it'd probably go down. Um, because the weights are changing, but but they what they saw was somewhere around the 36 people per square mile is is where they saw the cost changing. You know, again, I'm not I didn't see with the model itself, so I'm not 100 percent sure what they were looking at, but that's what they saw. And then they saw another inflection point when it when the population became um, at around 55. And so that that's why those two points were, were picked. They were the inflection points where the where the slope of the, the line changed noticeably, statistically significantly, I guess is the right way to put it. That's so, why they were chosen. And I assume that that analysis controls for all these other factors. I, I don't know how exactly you would do that, but um, if, if the low population district also has many poverty students. How do you control for that in terms I, of outcomes and, um, and those inflection points? I, I, I will tell you flat out, my statistics were too long ago to, to remember how they did it. I mean, if I sat down with the model and talked to them, I might remember. Uh -huh. um, 
but they there there are there are methods for controlling where you do um you can do you can run multivariate regression analysis where it's it's you're controlling for different things i don't remember how to control because again it's too long ago um but that's what they that's what they did if you would like a, a not too technical explanation you would you would probably need to ask professor Coley, and i'm sure she could give it to you i i don't think i'm qualified to do that and i also have not really seen their model as to what they were actually looking at specifically and so these numbers are here because these were the numbers in the study. We are, of course, not tied to anything in the world because we're the ones who need to put out the bill in the end, but that's why they're there. And, and is there a spreadsheet or a map or something that would show us which districts are in these categories? Yes, I, I, I actually pulled that up right before we started this, this part of the conversation. Let me go back to it. Um, there are districts that have school districts that have a sparsity of 36 or less, there are 42 of them. Um, there, see what's, I mean, if, if I'm going, I'm going from the top, um, we can start out, I'm just gonna read the first five or 10 or something. I won't even read you 10, but I'll read the first five. Um, there's Winhall, but they don't operate a school. There, there's Meadowy, which is, um, Meadowy is that, Ru, Ru, I wanna say Rupert and, oh, no, yeah, thank you, Rupert and Paula. Um, there's Peachum. There's, I can't read my own graph. Let me spread that out a little bit here. There's Caledonia Cooperative, um, which is, which is, Cal, which is um, Barnett. Um, Barnett Waterford. Yes, thank, thank you, <laughs> Barnett Waterford. <laughs> I actually know these, believe it or not. There's yeah. Canaan, there's the Northeast Kingdom Choice, Northern Mountain Valley. Um, there's Fletcher, there's Champlain Islands, Blue Mountain, which is which is uh, Rygate, Wells River, and um, uh, Groton. Um, there's Waits River Valley, Topsom, and, and uh, I, I used to tease there, I should know. Topsom. It's, it's okay. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you can put him on the spot. There's Strafford, Granville, Hancock. So there, there are actually quite a few. Um, and then if, if, if we look at those who are, let me get rid of that filter, those who are between 55 and 55 and 36, there are another 32 districts. And then there are 16 that are below 100 and then the rest are more. Um, yeah, Brad, um, can you tell me, tell me on your list there, and, well, first of all, could you send that list to Sorsha? Sure. And could you tell me how many of those um, most uh, sparse districts, how many don't operate a school? And what would be the reason it would cost more if you're not operating the school? It, it, does, it doesn't. Um, what, what I was just giving you was a list. I wasn't giving you a list of who gets the sparsity weight. I, Representative Ansel's question was more, or <coughs> I heard was more who, who is yeah. sparse. Right. Um, let, me, uh, let me jump back and I, I can tell you very quickly. Um, if I get back over here. So let me just lock it up this way. <laughs> Brad can send Julia a spreadsheet yeah, that's that messy, fun. and then Julia can format it into something readable for us. <laughs> that, that was not a dig on you, Brad. I was just trying to save you some time. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. I, you can go on with what you okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but but yeah, so I I can I can I can easily get that information out. That's not a problem. It's, it's sitting in the background of the model. Thank you. Um, Any other thoughts on the weight page? Yes. So, yeah, I'm just curious now that George asked that question about non-operating districts with sparse populations. Brad, so the, the weight is not applied? No, I, I thank you, Representative Durf, for saying that. I just realized I misspoke. I was thinking about the small schools one. The weight, the weight for sparsity is applied even if they don't have a school because it's a small, it's a it's a sparse school district. So it, it is applied. I misspoke a minute or two ago. But but if they don't have if they don't have a school, then they don't have a small school, so they wouldn't get that weight. That's right. Okay. So 
what's the logic behind applying it if they don't go to school? I'm not 100% sure I can answer that fully. Um, well, I mean, the, I think Scott has a perspective on it. Yeah, the, the, the kid still has to be educated. They still have all the underlying factors and some, some well, over half of them are gonna end up in a public school anyhow. And that school's gonna have to, you know, have the money to deal with that kid's needs. But I don't understand if you if your school is not. I don't, I don't understand how the sparsity of the district that is sending you to school affects how much it costs to educate you. Well, it'd be the same. So let's say, for example, let's say you have a district with a hundred, an operating district with a hundred kids. Okay, they're operating a school for those hundred kids. With a certain sparsity, okay. If that if that school, it's going to cost that school so much money to educate those one hundred kids. Okay. Let's say you have another school school district that has um, fifty kids that live in that district, and it, same that you know, and then you have and then you have these adjacent districts that are sending kids, you know, that are tuition kid to the district. Fifty kids. So you got a hundred kids, a hundred kids. If these hundred kids that are a combination of operating and tuitioning, if they have the same needs as the school district that has a hundred kids, then their operating costs are going to be the same. But they're tuitioning the kids. It's not costing the school district more because they're sparse to send to tuition a kid to another school. I'm saying they have the same sparsity. You know, if you have a district with a, a, a you know, a determined, a, a certain amount of sparsity, and the kids are all from that one district and they go to that one school, there's no difference between that and a same sparsity, same number of kids going to one school. It costs the same amount of money to educate them either way. Yeah, well, that's true, but that yeah. assumes the same sparsity between the sending areas. Yeah, the, the district where the school is, which is probably not the case in most instances. It's probably the yeah. school is in a more a less sparse district. Right. And so why does it cost the, and they're getting, you know, having, there's having a tuition bill to the sending school, the sending district. I agree. But you're, but you're talking about the nuance between, um, you know, combined districts. That doesn't necessarily it makes a difference whether that district is tuitioning in or that district is is joined. It's still the same. It's the same. It's going to cost the same amount of money to educate the kids. John, I so. think that the question that I'm str struggling with, and I just don't understand yeah. it yet, is that um, by using the sparsity weight uh, to, to follow the logic of what we're doing with weights, we're creating tax capacity. What, are, what, what do we want that district to do with that capacity? What, what is it that they're not doing currently that we want them to do with that additional capacity? And I don't understand it with sparsity. I do with some of the others, yeah. but- Well, wait, let's, especially let's, if you're not operating wait, a school. We're gonna go to David. Especially if you're not operating. I, so I, I don't want to necessarily cut off the conversation, but I think it, it, to me anyway, it's helpful to think that there are non-operating districts that have like Wynn Hall, uh, a school that was operating and it just, you know, at one point became, you know, that's an independent school. So it's they're dealing with the same population of students in the same building, just a different, uh, different arrangement. And then you've got districts like uh, di districts that have an approved independent school, sort of similar situation there, perhaps. And then others where they're just, you know, they're sending them to a town where there's a, there's going to be more population to start with. Just as we're thinking about it, I think there's maybe three different scenarios or at least two different scenarios that are in the background. It, I, I, could, it, could, um, it, 
Representative or Madam Chair, let, let me see if I can rephrase your question the way I, I think I'm hearing it. I'm not sure I'm hearing it this way, but I'm, I think I am. I think, I think what you're asking is, is there a difference in what kids need who come from a sparse district who do not have school, they're, they're tuitioned, versus what those kids need who are in a school? And is that where the costs are because of what, what's happening within the school itself? I was asking a question that was one step back. I'm okay. ignoring the tuition question. And I'm saying I'm in a sparse district and I get um, some additional weight as a result of the sparsity calculation. And the whole thinking behind this is that we're creating tax capacity because we want the district to do something better, right? But otherwise, if this isn't yes. worth doing. So what is it that we want that district in that sparse district? Ignore, ignore the tuition question. What is it we want the district in that sparse district to do differently? Well, I think, you know, Jim, go ahead. Well, we had this question a year ago with regards to English language learners. I understand well, them, I think. But, but I think I'm coming around, you know, the question was, if we change the categorical aid, is there any assurance that, the, as opposed to just putting it in weights, that that'll yes. actually get spent on them? I'm going to assume that we can assure that it's going to be spent, okay. and I want to know what it is we want them to do with that money. Spend it on on good education. Yeah, Chris. And I was just going to say the only thing that I can logically think of is transportation. Would be the only difference. Right. Right. right, but that would be the only difference. Scott and then Carol. So um, Chris, will you? I think at least twice I've been in the room with <laughs> Professor Colby when this yes. question has been yes. asked. And um, their analysis indicated that in areas of the state that were sparse, they did not have the same employment options uh, for both for subcontractor and for direct employees that um, more populated areas the state had and they were because they couldn't find them or they couldn't they because they couldn't find somebody there they were put into very expensive options or they were having trouble just holding on to their faculty that are going to districts that are able to pay more and because they have density and so these numbers were so that these uh, districts could compete with the larger districts for employees. And yeah. so to clarify, sort of, Professor Colby is very careful, as was Bruce when he came in, that their analysis around the weights does not point to any particular patterns of spending or point to what the money should be spent on. That it's just sort of the difference between these factors and costs. But the qualitative analysis that also happened pointed to what Scott was saying. And then also sort of in the subcontractor, like an example for me is that in my school district, which is not sparse, there's a lot of support from designated agencies in the schools that's available. Whereas in the more rural districts, even in my county, they have, they can't access designated agencies as easily. And so they have full-time staff to provide those same services, which winds up being- For just a few kids. For just a few kids. And that's just- sort of one example, homeless liaisons and like getting, you know, is sort of another one of those. Charlie, you had a, I think when I was at whole, okay. George? No, it's just oh, just leaning in. Right at how I, I look at that, if you're tuitioning a kid to another district, you don't have any of those expenses. So why in the world are you getting a sparsity up? It's just lowering your taxes. You're not spending anything more on the kids because that's being taken care of over at the, the school in a different district. I think in that you're assuming that wherever that kid's being tuition to, it has a, a dense population. It may not. Well, we, it, yeah. even if it doesn't, it's, it's in the tuition cost that they're charging you, their expenses. But if that, if that school, whether it's public or independent, is in a sparse area of the state, it's going to cost them more to provide those services, which means that's going to show up in the tuition cost. That's right. Yeah. So, so but why then should you additionally, when you're getting that tuition, it's getting in the tuition cost. Why should you, you why should you get a, um, 
a reduction. Well, I guess the weight isn't available in order to cover the higher tuition costs that district would. Yeah, that, that operating school in that case would only get the the sparsity. Um, they would only get their own density for the school, the kids that they're educating that are from their district. The, the weights don't follow the students. Yeah. Is that true for yeah, weights don't English follow. language learner? Yeah, it's different. Right. Weights don't follow students. In current law either. Yeah. Right, Brad? Right. The, 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 weight, the weights are at the district level. So, so in your example, George, let's say you had a district that they're operating at school, they've got their own kids, they would receive weights to help with educating those kids, but the help for the kids that are, you know, tuitioning in is they're, they're capturing that additional money that's needed through the tuition payment. How that district is affording that tuition payment is they get to keep that, they keep their weights. That's how it works. And to sort of add another, thank you. Another sort of hypothetical imagination part of this whole thing is um, that I can think of. So even if a kid in a super rural district, like somewhere in the kingdom, was tuitioned to a more urban district, that kid in their home and in their sort of home lands, home geography might not have the same sort of cultural resources um, at sort of their easy fingertips as a kid in a more urban district. I don't know if that's necessarily true, like given all the amazing cultural stuff that happens like, you know, right deep in the, like deep in the kingdom. Um, I don't know if that's true, say in Vermont, but it's generally how the differences between rural and urban education is thought of. I think Jim had a yeah. thing before we, did I see that? Nope, okay. Yeah, well, I mean, that conundrum is true. I mean, yeah. you have in lots of areas, I, I know right now that if you look at that list of districts that Brad was gonna send on, you will see districts that have an, an anchor school or a high school, and there is density right there in that town. But then when you look at the whole district and all those small towns outside of it, it trips one of these, one of these levels. You know, I, for example, I, you know, in St. Johnsbury, we don't trip any of these levels. Okay. Lindenville, which is about, you know, about the same population they're joined with a bunch of really small rural districts. So they basically are playing in the same labor market as St. Johnsbury, but they trip this population density thing. That, you know, has nothing to do with whether they're independent or operating or whatever. It's just, that's just the way you're gonna see those conundrums all over the state. Does that make logical sense to you? Yeah, yeah. Does that, that make logical sense to you? That one would trip it and well, it, 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 it doesn't because the, the St. J. Linden labor market is one big <laughs> labor market. You know? and and you, so, yeah. Your explanation about what you, why you need this is the only one I've heard that makes any sense to me. And I'm not sure that it makes, still makes sense to me at those break levels that we're talking about. Um, but I appreciate the discussion. But how much time do you Struggle have with us it. today? Because we didn't, I don't think we could stop time on your invitation. Uh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't have anything scheduled for the rest of the day. I had other work to do, but I was not scheduled, so I got the afternoon. Okay, so let's do one more question and then maybe finish up your slides. Is that, did you have something? Well, some comments as this yeah. conversation goes around. I agree with, with Scott. You started back a while ago um, saying that one of the reasons to provide extra resources for small schools, let's call it in simple language, you know, uh, density, is the factor that I, I, from my experience talking with other people in small towns, they have a difficulty uh, having the resources to hire qualified, um, the, the more qualified staff, particularly if they're trying to achieve a, a diverse curriculum or at least some more cost, co course offerings, they don't have people to do that. Um, so this makes sense, I think, um, to me. I think some of our examples, what of this, what of that, I think we're um, assuming the math is correct on what you prepared for us, Brad. Um, I think we're making the examples more complicated than they need to be. I mean, what we should do is follow through the math um, in, in parentheses on slide page four. Um, Brad, you said that um, 
Georgia had corrected for this varsity weight, but the, the math the addition under underneath in those columns you pointed out is not correct. In in the weighted ADM column, that's correct. The weighted and ADM. I, I forgot to update that. Yeah. Um, and, and and it would be nice to have that correct that if I were after this abortion in this this um misfortune to try to explain use using some of these slides to explain things to to constituents and i'd like to be able to work from corrected math rather than incorrect math by the out tripping over myself no i i i'll 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 make the corrections um and send them out to sorsha and, and uh, highlight that if people would like to highlight but in terms of saying that some of our examples comparing one thing to another thing i think we're making it more complicated than it needs to be if we work from from corrected math, we should be able to explain things. And if we pair one hypothetical against another hypothetical, that's where we get tripped up, I think. I'm trying to think about whether it makes sense to me. Anyway, my 10 cents for. And thank you, Brad. Sure. Yeah. My apologies. <laughs> um, we do that all the time. Me I do it a lot. <laughs> So, Brad, do you want to take us through this tax rate calculation? Sure. So, so, so now we're on slide six. Or at least I am. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so, I, I, I've also learned not to try to change things on the fly. <laughs> so, I think I would have learned that years ago, but I didn't. So, hypothetical example here, and this is simply to show how change and equalize people's changes to tax rates. That's really what this is designed to do. So we start out with every dollar that school districts are going to spend. So that's their budget plus any separately warned articles. So in this line, the total expenditures are $19,250,000. Um, they have offsetting revenues of $5,210,000. Those offsetting revenues would consist of federal money, um, the titles, you can see if it's th that type of thing. Uh, it would consist of um, special education aid, transportation aid. If they received a small schools or merger support grant, it would show up there. If they were a town that received tuition students, the tuitions would be there. If they had a surplus, it would be on that line. This is also the line where the cost factor adjustments would appear. They would, they would appear as, as an offsetting revenue, okay, reducing, reducing that, that um, overall expenditure number. So when you subtract those two numbers, you get education spending. And that, that's just over $14 million in this case. And again, as I said, if, if you were adding the cost factor adjustments, that 5.2 million number would go up to maybe six or $7.2 million and the education spending would decrease accordingly. In this, in this fictitious example, we have 780 equalized pupils. If you take the education spending of just over 14 million divide by 780 equalized pupils, you get spending per pupil. And that's eighteen thousand dollars in this case, and then fictitiously picked a, a property yield of twelve thousand um, dollars, and so when you divide the spending per pupil, the education spending per equalized pupil, technically, by the property yield of twelve thousand, you get a dollar fifty. That's what the rate would be if that's what's called the equalized tax rate, and that's what the school district generates, and then that gets sent out to the towns that are that are members of the school district town or towns plural. At that point, then the town will apply its common level appraisal. In this case, I chose 93%. Why? I don't know, but I always seem to choose that number. You divide the equalized rate by the, by the CLA and you come up with an actual tax rate that is on the home bill that, that is applied against people's property value of $1.613. So that's, that's very quickly how tax rates are calculated. So if we jump to the next slide, slide seven, what I've done is I've shown you the exact same thing in that first column, no changes. I've highlighted the equalized pupils and the, and the equalized tax rate. And then in the column two, I still have it labeled long-term ADM because that's what I talked to you guys about before because we were talking in terms of cost equity and such. But this could be equalized pupils, which I really meant to change it to and didn't. Um, so in this case, I, forgetting that it says long-term ADM, and, and, and I, will, I will change this one to Representative Maslin um, so that it's right. Um, when, when I, in this case, when you apply the new weighting factors, the, the equalized people count increased. So it went from in the 780 to 794, where presuming spending hasn't changed. 
in this case, and the yield hasn't changed. In reality, probably both would, but we're not worried about that. This, you, we still have that same education spending of $14 million just over. We divide by a higher number now, 794, and so you get a smaller education spending per equalized pupil figure on line five. You're getting 17,683 now. When you divide that by the yield, same yield, 12,000, you get an equalized rate of $1.474. So it's dropped two and a half, two, 2.6 cents. Brad, the, in example one, the sort of first set of math is current law, and the second set of math is if you applied the new weights that are in. Yes, yeah. And again, yes. 287. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. And then again, I just multiply, divided by the CLA and you come up with a lower tape rate that would show up on a tax rate of $1.58.5. Then if we jump to seven, it's, it's the opposite. It's rather dark blue and my print off here. And what I've now done is again, new, using the new weights and again, still mislabeled improperly in the second column. Um, Are you on page eight? Page eight, yes. Um, so somebody saying ahead, something? Sorry. Okay, that's right. So, so now what I've done is again, new, new, new weights in this case, the, the equalized people count has decreased. So it went from 780 down to 770, same spending per pupil. So, or not, pardon, not same spending per pupil, same education spending. Line five though is a different number. When you divide 14,440,000 by of education spending by 770 pupils, you come up with the education spending of 18,234. So same level of spending, fewer pupils, higher spending per pupil means a higher tax rate. So you divide that by 12,000, you get $1.52. And divide that by the CLA, you get $1.63.4 on, on the uh, homestead tax rate that people actually see. So all I wanted you to see here was keeping spending constant. If you change the equalized pupil count up or down, it, it affects tax rate. You guys all knew that, but there are just a couple of quick examples, slightly mislabeled, of course, uh, that I will fix. And just so you see it happens in front of you. Brad, when we were talking about the equalization ratio before, in the difference between current law and the new proposed weights in 287, mm -hmm. how different is the equalization ratio in these scenarios? And how much further away is the equalized people numbers from the long term ADM numbers? The, equal, the equalization ratio is going to change dramatically. Um, that's the best word I can come up with for it. And that's because you can, you can see that we have added not only more factors to, the, to, to what we have for current law in the proposal, but also some of them are increased significantly. Um, example, uh, poverty is a way, it has a current law weight of 0 0.25 under the proposal is 1.03. So it's significantly higher. So what we've done is we've really increased the, the denominator of the equalization ratio. So it's going from somewhere around 93% to about 62, 63% in the modeling that I've done. It's, it's a significant difference. Again, everybody decreases by that same amount because it's getting applied, applied across everything. I, I, off the top of my head, and I don't have it right in front of, me, of how many people are winning and losing versus their long-term ADM, but it, it, it's going to shift um, because because the we have now, we now have new weights and we have different weighting factors. Um, so it's it's go, it's going to shift who's who's winning quote unquote winning who has more and who has less than what their long term ADM is. I, mean, I can I can certainly generate something that shows you what's happening with the model that we're doing again we're using FY twenty numbers but I can do that. Thanks. <laughs> Any other thoughts from anyone in the final five minutes here? Yeah, George. Um, Brad, if we go with the cost factor um, adjustments, I'm wondering whether those should actually follow a student rather than, you know, if a student's tuition or goes to a since so they're coming in as like a categorical A, um, wondering about your thoughts on that. 
a big thought for the final five minutes. Yeah. I'm sorry, big thought. Something to think about a little bit because maybe it makes more sense than just reducing the tax rate. Um, the money go with the chip. Yeah, I, it'd be it'd be a whole separate proposal. I mean, whole a whole new proposal. I'd have to think about a lot. Um, I'm glad I warned you now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then did you have something? Well, I was just going to say, why why wouldn't we do it that way? That, just to pose the question differently, why why would we um, not have the adjustment on all the students? Um, one conniption, for lack of a better word, is because we don't control it all for tuition. We're trying to control for all the little things within that. But when those district bills, Bill Stafford, um, I have we have other than what we pay the bill. Maybe we don't have a high school. I, we Stafford has no control over over what the tuition is on the other end, and I think that throws the calculation potentially off considerably. In terms of who gets the money and then who pays the money, pay over here, send it over there. So um, the question on why the weights don't follow is a good question, but then we open another can of worms. Well, I, I think you do, and fundamentally, I'm, I, I think what I'm stuck on, though, is trying to figure out how would you do tax rates. So somebody may have an answer to that, but off the top of my head, I don't, um, because we still have to raise the money, which comes from tax rates. I don't, you know, I think you could, I mean, just, yeah, I'm sure you can, but yeah. well, I mean, what would happen is, is that, you know, wherever the schools are that are, that are taking these kids, it doesn't think it matters whether they're public or independent is, is that if those kids are coming with dollars to um, assist the, whoever's providing the education with their unique circumstances, then all your, then all your tuition should reflect at that point. It's just, what a general education would, you know, would would require. Um, I mean, the the tuitioning. I mean, it would it would work itself out. I mean, it, you would just see you would probably see tuition rates come down to re, to reflect that. I, I guess I I would wonder how long that would take. And what Brad said about how to calculate tax rates, the towns that are sending kids out who wouldn't have a cost factor adjustment in there as part of the funding available to them would wind up with tax rates to cover all of yeah. this, this tuition goes down. No. Yeah. If the tuition went down, but how long would it be like, I guess I would wonder what the buffer would be between when the tuition goes down and based on yeah. base cost yeah. for students. Yeah. Not, you know, yeah. Not all those things that come in with categorical aid. You see, these schools are very, I mean, they, I mean, they're having conversations with school boards. They know what their areas can afford. They, they have those conversations all the, all the time. Uh, they, they know what the impact on the tax rates are. The tuition, whatever tuition they decide, they decide on, they know that that impacts the tax rate of the districts that are sending kids to them. They know that. Brad, do you have any final thoughts before we take a farewell? No, I I don't think so. Um, no, not 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 that I can think of. I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you might have for me still, but I don't think I have any other thoughts. No thoughts. <laughs> Use them up for the day. I'm not sure I had any today. <laughs> well, I want to be sure to thank you for joining us on really really short notice. Um, Oh, you're, you're welcome. I, I mean, I, I shouldn't have tried to change things, which, should, you know, but I did. <laughs> yeah, Thanks, Brad. Thank you, Brad. It was really Thanks. helpful. You're very welcome. I'll talk to you all later. Carol. Carol. I think we can. Oh, Carol, sorry. Oh, your hand is up first. I was waving to Brad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just generally thinking about this. We allow local control 
we allow so, so, so just because we've been in this room for a really long That's time, what I'm if we're going to keep talking, I want to do maybe a 10 minute break first okay. before we do that. Okay.